Our guest speaker, Todd Zakrajic, uh, has written a book that um, some of your first year studies faculty members have found very useful in their teaching with um, first year students and students in general. We wanted to add on an extra session and invite any students and invite faculty members to, to have their students come. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Todd Zakrajic from uh, Chapel, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and he is going to talk to you on the new science of learning, study less and learn more. Thank you. So here's, the, here's what I'm after. I'm just gonna, we're gonna play around 45 minutes or so, see if I can help out with just some ways of thinking about the, the concept of learning. Um, I'm a cognitive behavioral psychologist. Actually, I'm an industrial psychologist with cognitive behavioral training. I've spent most of my life teaching. Um, I taught my first class a long, long time ago. I'm a psychologist, so I teach a lot of psychology kind of things. And now I'm in the School of Medicine working with doctors doing these types of things and helping for teaching medical students. So here's what I'm after. That was the cover of the little book I wrote. The concept is this. Most individuals don't have a clue at how they learn. They don't actually process how they learn. We do the same type of thing over and over again and not actually know what's going on. It's because of the way the human brain is wired. We have to be wired this way or life would be absolutely incomprehensible. If you lose your glasses by putting them on top of your head, and it's actually kind of fun, when, if, you've, if you're this kind of person, if somebody comes up to you and they got the glasses on top of their head and said, have you seen my glasses? You just have to say things like, I think they're on your dresser. And then they run to the dresser and then they come back and say, no, they weren't there. So, Did you look in the kitchen? And you run them around until they eventually see they're on top of their head and then they figure it out. The reason they lose them, or if you're the one who's lost them, it's because once you feel pressure on top of your head for putting the glasses there, your brain decides there's no new information so it shuts it down. When you're crossing a road, if you step between two parked cars and cross the road, look both ways and have a couple cars go and then go, you'll notice that you, most people don't notice this, that you'll step between two parked cars very, very quickly and then stop to see if there's anybody coming and then you take off again. You have decided that parked cars have very little information in terms of killing you and moving cars have more information. So that's the kind of stuff we do all the time without even thinking about it. Another one is when you're reading. If you're reading, what you may notice is you could be flipping through a, or reading through a book and as you're reading, all of a sudden, huh, I've been thinking about bacon for the last four pages. <laughs> or if you're a vegetarian, I don't know, lettuce or something. I don't know, I don't understand vegetarians. But still, so if you're thinking about something else, the concept is at some point your brain has decided that you're no longer interested in the material, which wouldn't happen with this particular book, but other books, but you're no longer interested in the material and suddenly you're thinking of something that does interest you. But what's really neat is you didn't probably catch when that happened. And actually, when you're reading, if you have the opportunity, which you all have, to pause every page or every section and just say, okay, what did I just read? That, will say, that alone will save you a ton of time. Because you see, everybody in here, you all have a situation where sometimes you're feeling really good and when you pick up a material, you can just read through it very quickly. You have other times when you start to read and you think, no way, there is no way I can read this right now. It's just, I, I don't have the energy to do it. In between, yes, I feel great, and no, I cannot read it right now, there's a mid spot. And right about in here is when you're reading, but you're not processing very well. A little bit over here is you're reading and not processing much at all. A little bit more this way, you're reading and processing a lot more. If you're paying attention to when you're paying attention, you can catch it. You notice when you, when you park your car and get out of your car and come in, I mean, your parking lot here is amazing. By the way, it's a very interesting kind of concept you have here. You just hunt until you see somebody who's walking and then you stalk them. And you kind of, I think it's, there's, a, there's a spot where it's okay to follow them, but there's another one like if, they're, if you're walking and the car is like one foot behind you, 
that's just creepy. But, you know, they want the spot. So the point here is, as you're going along, and then do you ever just walk extra to make them do that? I kind of like that thing. It's fun, too. I mess with people all the time. But whenever you park your car, you remember where it's at, you can get there. But other times, you come out the door, and it's like, I can't imagine with that parking lot. You come out the door, and you think, ah, oh, crap. It is a massive parking lot if you don't remember where you parked. And then you look like one of the idiots that walks along with the thing over your head, and you just keep walking and clicking the button until your car beeps. By the way, another small cue for you. If you lose your car and you have to use the clicker thing to do this, don't hit the honk button. A honk is hard for the human brain to identify which direction it's from. Hit the panic button. Because if your alarm goes off and goes eh, 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 it's much easier to find where the car is located than with the beeping, especially if you got one that just beeps a little. So there's one for you too. But there's a reason that some days you forget. And what I'm after in this whole concept here is if you ever catch yourself forgetting to say, why today? Why can't I find it today and yesterday it was no problem? So that's the kind of stuff we're after. By the way, is any, did you, anybody want this one? I've got a couple extra copies. Sorry. There, your hand went up very quickly. Here, you can have this one. Hey, you know, read it, sell it on eBay, give it to a friend. That's a good one. All right. Now. There's also a difference between implicit and explicit learning. I just mentioned that with the, with the car. Sometimes you know where your car is, sometimes you don't. So here's stuff you learn all the time. Watch this. Oh, by the way, before I do this, when's the first time you probably took a test? How old were you when you took a test the first time? Four. Four. What kind of test? Yeah, letters, right? What letter is this? Probably colors, too. Like, what color is this? Blue. Nope, it's green. And so you practice and practice. But about four years old. When's the first age when you probably took an academic test? What do you think? Six? What kind of test would it be? You can do this. I believe in you. Yeah, bath test. Two plus two. Spelling test. What is this word? I don't know. It's the, T-H-E. Oh, okay. What's this word? I don't know. It's and, A-N-D. What is this word? I don't know. You just did it. It was T-H-E. It's the. Okay. What is this word? It's and. Whew. What is this word? I don't know. It's the. Oh, yeah. I remember that. It starts with a T. Yes, it did. What is it? I don't know. It's T-H-E. And you just did that over and over and over again. You did that until you got very, very proficient at something. And then the next thing you know, you blink, and about 15 years of your life is gone, and you've got a card, and you say, mitosis, meiosis. And you're using the same type of techniques people tend to as they learned when they were five, six, seven years of age. So the concept is learning other things. But sometimes you didn't use flashcards. So here's an example of one. Oh, the microphone, this is going to be great. <laughs> there we go. This ought to work out really well. <laughs> All right, this is about the time I normally ask for volunteer. Oh, you look perfect. Well, no, you don't have to move or anything. I just like watching people all stressed out. All right, even the guy next to you is not happy. You're all right with this, all right? You so, yeah, you don't care so much. These guys are pretty cool, though. Now, I see bad experiences. Here's the deal. Nobody in this room ever studied flashcards to find out what would happen if this balloon pops, right? That was part of just living. It turns out that as you go through life, most of the stuff you learned, you learn because of how it impacts you in your life. There's a huge issue here. Huge issue is I teach statistics. And if I'm teaching statistics and happen to say, and those of you who understand that statistics is one of the coolest things in the world, those are the smart people in the room. Those of you who think statistics is stupid, it's not stupid, you're stupid. So, see, we have to start fights periodically. Now, the issue here, though, is if I tell you this next thing that we're learning has no implication on your life at all, you're never going to need it again, except it's going to be on the exam, so you need to learn it for the exam. You all know how hard that is to learn that then. Because the whole time you're studying, you're thinking, this is stupid, this is stupid, I'm never going to need it. There's other things in your life, though, that as soon as it happens, you internalize it because it has something to do with your life. Watch this. This is actually kind of funny. <laughs> First of all, I've got to put this away because there's at least two people that won't process anything while this is around. There. It's all hidden. Okay? 
Now, time for your quick quiz. How, let's, we'll start with this one. What color is the balloon? Are you sure it's green? You're positive. See, if I go over there and pull a balloon out and it's not green, if it's like yellow or something, you would assume that I tricked you some way. You saw it, it was green. How many steps was it from here over to the lectern and back when I, took, when I was walking around with the balloon? Yeah, we could guess and make assumptions, but the interesting thing is both of those were perfectly visible. You can tell how many steps I took. You didn't process that because quite frankly, you don't care. You did process the balloon because quite frankly, the balloon has some bearing. So that's the difference that you have. You're doing that all the time. So the caring part is actually pretty important. By the way, although some of you hate the popping of balloons, there's others in here I know human nature that would be very disappointed if we didn't pop it. Oh, that was a close one. All right, ready? Just clear your minds. Get the levels right on the mic. Oh, wait a minute. Did you feel that? Trade your hand if you felt that in your stomach or something. You felt it? Come on, come up here. Okay, good. Anybody who ever says, well, I got jumping ahead of myself. You know what, that, that's an adaptive response. We know unconditionally that the balloon loud makes a loud noise. A loud noise will make you tense up. You either had it in your stomach or you had it in your shoulders. If anybody ever jumps out at you though, and makes you jump, the reason you tense and the reason you do that is you protect the most important parts of your body. Most people don't know this. You orient toward a noise because the hind brain right back in here is massively important. That's kind of why it's there. It kind of protects you. It's down in here. It allows you to breathe. It's respiration. It's heart rate. It's all that stuff. It's right there. When you hear a loud noise that makes you uncertain about something might be dangerous, you can't help yourself. Most people will shrug their shoulders and look at it. You look toward danger because it actually orients your head in such a way that you're protecting yourself. Plus you're gathering information. You're also constricting blood vessels so that if you happen to get cut, you would bleed less. So when you make this response, you're actually in an adaptive response that would help you survive. So the next time somebody jumps out and says, ha ha, made you jump, you say, no, you know what you did? You created a physiological response which is adaptive to my survival. And the fact that I jumped like that means that I'm more likely to survive than you. So there. I had two friends in high school. I'm not bragging, but I had two. Now, you're welcome. <laughs> See, that was perfect because they applauded me. This, by the way, is why you should never chew on a balloon. So those of you who still chew on balloons, don't do it. If you're ever walking along and you see a baby chewing on a balloon, these rubbery fragments flying through the air while a child is gasping, because kids will chew on a balloon because they don't know the, the response you've got. Yeah, they will later. But if they chew on the balloon, it pops, they go, <gasps> and they breathe this in, then that gets in their throat and you can't heimlich this thing out. So that's why babies die who chew on balloons. So the next time you see a parent with a baby chewing on a balloon, you just walk up and say, oh, why do you want your baby dead? And then you can explain this and then it helps them to learn. It's like you're a giver. Okay, I have saved so many lives. And people thank me all the time. They use weird words like, get the heck away from me, but I know inside they're thanking me. All right, we don't care about that one. Okay, this task right here, tell you what, don't, this is gonna be overwhelmingly difficult for you. Do not talk to your neighbor just on your own. Don't iPhone this, don't Google it, just look up here and see if you can find the right penny. I'm telling you, you're gonna, you're gonna want so much to turn to somebody and say, I think it's G, what do you, don't do that. It's by yourself. Okay, we're just gonna give you a few seconds here. See if you can find the real US penny. It's tough, isn't it? I tell you, it's tough stuff. All right, so now I'm going to ask you which penny you like best. Don't be one of those weak people that says, oh, I wonder if anybody else is picking this. You got to just put your hand up and be proud of your response. So just that. Right? How many like A? Anybody like A in here? No, okay, B's. Any B's? C's. C's. D's. E's. F's. 
G. Couple G's, good. H's, ooh, good, Fair, several H's, good. I's, lots of I's, well done. J's, nice. See how encouraging I am? K's, couple K's. L's, excellent. M's, couple M, one M, good. N's, O's, none of the above. None of the above. Why would you pick none of the above? Yeah. No, two of you. Why two of you pick none of the above? Uh, All right. Why would you pick none of the above? Oh, that's a good one. No mint mark. Oh, there should be a mint mark. That's good. But there's not on the Philadelphia ones, the planes. There is for San Francisco. The Denver had a D. San Francisco has an S. Philadelphia has nothing. We're in close proximity to Philadelphia. We should know that one. <laughs> the which? I've had other people tell me it's none of the above, too. It's actually none of the above. I know. It's all right. It's none of the above because I said, which one's the real U.S. penny? And these are all representations. Ah, that's so funny. No, I was told that once by a philosopher. Guy said, none of the above. And I said, yes, it is. He said, no, it's not. And he said, yes, it is. And we went back and forth a couple times. And finally, he says, no, you said a real. And those are representations. I said, what's your field? He said, philosophy. So we all know that philosophers are just psychologists with no data. So <laughs> that's why it didn't bother me too much. All right, so here's the deal. 90% um, of the people get this wrong. And the reason they get it wrong is because what do you really need? Why, actually, maybe you know this. Why would you get this wrong? Actually, pretty much, I only saw one hand for the right answer in here. No one cares about pennies. Exactly. No one cares about pennies, but that's not the right answer. But I like how you said it with assertiveness, which was good. If I took a handful of coins, though, and said these are all U.S. coins and tossed them onto a table, how many are pennies, you'd pick it out like that. So it's not that we don't care about pennies. We can't tell something about these pennies. It's the details, right? What do you need to know that a coin is a penny? It's the what? You're way smarter than he is. So color and size. <laughs> I'm sorry, I only said that because you seem stronger and she seemed kind of weak and I thought she needed this nice comment. Okay, that's good. You're not really weak. I was just saying it because he felt bad that I had said, no, no, no. So okay, so here's the deal. Yes, it's color and size, you're dead on right. Once we see that it's this big, it's copper color, it's this size, whatever, we're done. When we're learning, that's what we do all the time. When you look at stuff and you say, okay, I've got it. It's this size. If you're learning about bones in the body and you say, okay, I got it. It's the learner's the one that decides when you stop learning. The tricky spot, and this is what's really hard about this whole gig, is that the teacher or the expert, whoever you're learning from, sees a lot of details and a lot of other aspects to it. So as a learner, all we're trying to do is figure out what do I need to know to make it, to identify it at the lowest level, and then we stop. The same thing is what happens with most sports. Unless you hate all sports, everybody has a sport that they dislike. And usually what the sport is that you dislike is because it's boring. And most sports are boring because we don't know the details of the sports. And if you start to learn it, you think, okay, I got it, it's golf. You hit a ball, it goes in a hole. It's pennies, it's this big, it's copper. But most people don't get this. And by the way, we bought a lottery ticket, I just wanna let you know, we bought, this, we bought the lottery ticket for the big, the big one recently, there's like a billion dollars. We could get 200 million each in our family. And I asked my one daughter what she would do with her 200 million. She said, I'm gonna buy a sports team. I said, I don't know if you can buy a sports team for 200 million. She says, 200 million is a lot of money. I said, I don't think you can still do it. I said, I don't think you can. She said, what if I buy a curling team? She's a smart kid. I'm pretty sure you get, you know what curling is? It's one of the most exciting sports out there. All right. How many of you had A when we started? A is the right answer. Just one guy. Hey, I got extra. Did somebody else? I got, I, I think I brought, I brought a couple extra copies. I'm telling you, you can sell these on eBay probably. This was number five on Amazon for a while. Yeah, so that brings credibility to a system somehow. There you go. All right. Now. So the concept here, when we're learning stuff, we tend to, once we see we have enough information, we tend to stop. So you have to just be careful and kind of fight through that spot. The brain also does this because we all have to stop at a certain spot because if you keep going, that's what OCD is. 
OCD is when people keep processing and processing and learning and learning when they could stop. So you got to be careful though because you're going to be tempted to stop before you should. All right, next task for you. I'm trying to find out a few things. So look up here real quickly. These are different study strategies. Oh, before we even do this one, I got to practice, want to show you one that's kind of cool here. Five days before an exam. If it's five days before the exam and you could study two hours a night for five days or 10 hours the night before, which one's going to get you the higher score on the test? Not what you would do, which is going to get you the higher score. How many of you like the five nights at two hours a night? Put your hands up real quickly. All right, put your hands up so we can see where you're voting in. Okay, how many like the cramming the night before? All right, cool, it's about two thirds and one third. Okay, good. The higher score will come from cramming. So there's something you're not normally told. Cramming the night before the test will generally get you a higher score on the test, by and large, than studying for five nights at a couple hours a night. Here's the downside to that. About a week later, the people who crammed, about 80 to 90% of the material is gone, and if you watch this, you feel it happening. In fact, while you're taking a test, sometimes you can feel the material seeping away while you're taking the test. So the really bright students will quickly jot down some stuff in the margin because they know it's going to be gone in an hour or so. Well, if it's going to be gone in an hour, you know it's going to be gone in a day or two for sure. So the tricky spot is, if you cram for a test, then the exam comes up at the end, the comprehensive final, the material's all gone. And that's why I have medical students who ask me this. It's like, hey, I don't understand. I take these unit exams and I get like high scores, you know, an A and A and A and A, and then I take the comprehensive test and I get a C. So can you explain why that would happen? Well, yeah, easy. You cram for each one of these, then you come down to the end and you have to do well on this one. It means you have to relearn everything for the whole semester and the material's gone. So that's one of those other ones. If you read and pay attention while you read, you can read a lot less because you'll be focused when you are reading. If you do have the time to, to study for the test across time instead of cramming, you have tons, and I mean it's a huge factor, of not having to relearn it later. My daughter, who is a sophomore in college, she's really cool, the other day she said to me, she said, I got a real problem on this next exam. I don't have time to space out the, test, the study periods, but I know if I cram, I'm gonna forget it all before the comprehensive final. So what would you suggest in terms of me learning the most I can right now? But again, it's what you guys all know too. She knew that if she crammed, it would be gone at the end. So we talked a little bit about how she could read, take some notes, and then review the notes even like the day after the exam, and it would actually increase her knowledge later. It's really a weird thing. If the day after the exam, you go over the exam and read through the exam and, and kind of look at what you got right, what you got wrong, why you got the right, why you got it wrong, we're talking an hour or two. Three weeks later, those people in a test situation, would remember significantly more material than the person who didn't do that. So it's just a little post hoc review of the material. All right, so this thing right up here. Quickly glancing up there, I'm kind of fun with this thing here. These are popular study techniques. I'm just gonna ask you straight up because we don't have a whole lot of time here. Which one, which one would you look up there and, and, and suggest that is not very effective? If we look at everything like summarization, Highlighting keywords, imagery, rereading, practice testing, distributed, all those. Which is one that you would say out of the gate, you know, I don't think this is very effective. All right. Pick one. Which one? Highlighting. Really? Highlighting. How many of you would pick highlighting? I'm just curious about the highlighting. Oh, cool. How many of you highlight? <laughs> okay, that's good. Usually we get this, almost everybody highlights, almost everybody says it's not real effective. It turns out that highlighting is actually detrimental to learning sometimes. The people who highlight actually do worse on tests than people who don't highlight. Now, here's where you have to be careful. Number one, if you're using that four color highlighting method, I would encourage you to stop it immediately. The four color highlighting method is when you pull up the four different colors and as you're reading, you have things, well I'm not gonna practice doing this. As you read along, you think, oh I'm gonna highlight this in blue because it's important. I'm gonna do this one in red or a pink because it's really important. I'm gonna do this one in green because it's an application. I'm gonna do this one in, what did I miss here? Yellow, very good. I do a yellow one because it's a concept or a, uh, something I have to look up later. I would still encourage everybody to also use black if you're gonna do that and the black one would be for the really stupid stuff, and there's no reason to look at that in the future, it would just be gone. So the concept there, 
is highlighting and, and, and underlining tends not to work unless you do it specifically for a purpose and keep it very minimal. If you're going to highlight something, it should be no more than one or two things per page. And the idea there is you're finding the most important thing. The tricky spot is, and most people don't realize this, if you're highlighting as you go, you tend not to be thinking about the whole context. You fragment it. It'd be like taking the chapter and making a PowerPoint presentation out of it. So you have to be really, really careful with that. I'm just going to cut to the chase because we're getting close on time here. Um, Rereading. Rereading is another one that we have to be very careful with. And the problem with rereading is that most times, if people's minds tend to water when they read, you wander even more when you reread. So again, I'm just, I can't impress upon this enough. As you're reading, pay attention to when you're paying attention. So if you catch yourself, it's, it's, it's loud. We could go and tell them to quiet down, but they're having a birthday party for someone who's like, that's why I said they're having a birthday party for someone who's like 80, right? And, so, yeah, so we got to let that go. We could sing too, but I'm really not feeling the singing part. So here's the deal. If you're rereading and you're thinking to yourself as you read, I've already read this stuff once. I didn't like it the first time. I really don't like it this time. And as that's happening, the problem is you're not processing anything. In fact, anytime you are studying anything and thinking about how much you don't like doing it, you'd be, and the whole thing we talked about it was study less and learn more, you could stop studying and be fine. Because if your whole concept is, let's applaud. I think that was, was very good, thank you. Okay, now, <laughs> they, were, they had a lot of enthusiasm. Anytime you're thinking about how much Anything, anytime you're thinking about anything other than the material itself, it's really quite similar to just not even processing it. So just keeping that in mind. And if you're rereading it, you can reread it a second time and it can work, but you have to reread it with a purpose. I'm reading it because of this. And you watch for certain things. That can be helpful. The same as highlighting. If you highlight with a purpose, you can do it. The best things up here, the distributed practice for long-term learning is really, really good, but the by and large very best thing up here is practicing at retrieval, practicing at retrieving information. Whoops, this was the, yeah, we don't care about those. Here it is, practicing at retrieving. So here's the quick study. <clears throat> the first bar right here is if I study something four times, and the study that went with this is the people were given a passage to read. The first group, read the passage like four times. They read it, they read it, they read it, they read it, then waited five minutes and took a quiz. The quiz was 83% right by the, for the group for the most part. The next group, they read it three times, read it, read it, read it, and then took a practice quiz, no feedback on this practice quiz, and then five minutes later took the real quiz. And the real quiz they scored about 72, 73. The last group read it one time, and then a practice quiz, no feedback, practice quiz, no feedback, practice quiz, no feedback. And you can't get feedback because it'd be like learning more material. They just want you to practice it pulling the material out. They scored about a 73. This, the findings are pretty clear here. It's been replicated many times. If you read it more, then you actually can answer more questions. That's five minutes later. If you come back a week later, this is the cool one. It looks more like that. This group here, this is a broken axis, so that's not zero down here, it's 40%, but this group is 50% more retention than this group. It's 50% more retention, and keep in mind that this group here only read the material one time, and then they practiced three times at retrieving, but their retrieval sessions were no longer than the, re than the reading sessions. So th they spent the same amount of time and learned 50% more stuff. So that concept there is things like um, flashcards, quizzing your neighbor, teaching your neighbor something, teaching your friend something, anything that results in you practicing information and pulling it out. The brain is amazingly good when you practice it over and over again. So I asked the, I asked the administrators a little bit earlier today, we'll see how you guys do. <clears throat> Who was the first president of Stockton University? Now pause for a second. This is the practice at the, what your brain's actually doing. What's the first name that came into your mind when I ask you that question? It's what? Richard Stockton. That's a good one. Richard Stockton's a good name. But there was a name that came in your mind before that name. You were so fast, you thought two names. 
What was the first name? That's it. This is really good. That whole row is like geniuses. All right, George Washington. You see, what happened is if you weren't really processing it, what really happened was when I said, who is the first president? You said Washington. I said, of Stockton? I don't know. So you very quickly pulled the information out and then decided you couldn't answer the whole question. You do this all the time. But the reason that you pulled it up so quickly was you've practiced at retrieving first president Washington, first president Washington, first president Washington. Who is the first president? Washington. You do that. It's a process called long-term potentiation. It's the way the brain works so that you can keep going. You see, you have to get rid of all the stupid stuff and then let your brain just do that automatically. Could you imagine if you had to process everything? Like your respiration, breathe, and your heart rate, beat, 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 ooh, breathe, beat, 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 starting to walk, engage left foot, shift weight to right foot, shift weight, left foot, breathe, respiration, breathe, no, I'd breathe, beat, 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 heart, heart, heart. I mean, you, it would very shortly become totally overwhelming. So what your brain does is any neuronal pathway that fires a lot, now of course there's a difference between smooth muscles for the stuff that we do like heart rate because we can't be thinking about that. And you don't want to say to yourself, I think I will stop breathing and then you just die or my heart would stop. You can't just stop your heart. But the concept is there are certain things that are automatic and others that are not. When you first start walking, when people first start walking, if you happen to see a little baby, usually it's babies who start walking, but you see a little baby that starts to walk and they take like two or three steps and you say, oh, what a big boy, what's the first thing that happens, what happens next? You know this one? You got a baby that just started walking and you say, wow, look at you walk, what happens to the baby at that time? They fall. If you haven't tried this and you're around a baby that starts to walk, just say, wow, you are such a big boy. You sound supportive and yet you can watch them fall. It's kind of a win-win. So, seems mean, I suppose. But when the baby falls, it's because the baby can't look at you and process the verbal information and walk at the same time. However, after you walk a lot, you become so proficient at it, you don't have to think about walking. And what you'll find is when people get in accidents and they lose the ability to walk, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to relearn how to walk. The concept here is you've practiced it so many times it becomes just automatic and it's called automaticity. It's when you learn all kinds of things in the classroom. Sports. Sports do the same thing. If you're kicking field goals for a team, you're playing football and you're kicking field goals, can you imagine the coach and if you come out and he says, I want you to kick a 20 yard field goal and you line it up and you kick it. And then of course what a good coach would say is good for you, you've now kicked a field goal. Go and take it easy. No. I happen to be at a place that, and it's on videotape so I feel bad about this, but quite frankly they used to play basketball. Um, I think Tar Heels have now lost three of their last five games. I mean, even losing some sad, sad games they had in hand. But the issue here is, old Roy Williams, who's the basketball coach, doesn't tell the basketball players, you know, just dribble the ball a few times and go hit the showers. You do stuff until it becomes automatic. And the reason is you want it so that you don't have to think about it. So kicking a field goal, you kick it and kick it and kick it until you just can't, you just, you have the same action over and over again. And what you're after is once you start, and you watch those guys when they line it up, they always take their steps, they pick their spot, they, everything is so routine that once they start to move toward kicking that ball, they have an exact sequence that they do, but physiologically, that sequence fires more easily than other sequences. The thing I've just described is why your habits are tremendously hard to break. If you decide you're going to start exercising and you haven't been, if you're going to eat different kinds of food, if you're going to start different, you know, you got to, I'm going to rebuild my golf swing. Whatever it is you're going to do, you will find it massively difficult because when you start to engage the behaviors that you've always done, those are the ones that work. You might say, I'm going to be nicer to people, even stupid people like you. And you think, oh, darn, I missed again. It's because there are certain thoughts and certain ways of doing things that move faster than others. So that's what we have to do. We build that automaticity in. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Mueller and Dweck. This is on a little task. Again, just try this real quickly. Suppose we have acronyms or um, anagrams. We have words up here that we mix them up, we get brand new words. So if you mix up mug, you get what? Tom, very good. So you do a whole long list of these. I'm talking a big long list. After you've done a big long list of these, do that so you don't get hurt. 
Now I come back, and this is, again, psyche experiments are kind of cool. Everything else is identical. The only difference is the people who were in this group, I would tell you, good for you, you did well. That's all I do. The next group, I say, good for you, you did well. You must be really smart. And the last group, I say, good for you, you did well. You must have worked really hard on this. Everything else is exactly the same. That's the only difference. Whether I said, good for you, good for you, you must be smart. Good for you, you must have worked hard. After we do this, good for you, you all did really well on that one, then we come back with another list. So then I would have you solve these. And again, this is just an example. The list would be like 30, 40 long. So marching is, well done. How about thickens? Not enough C's. Dang, it does look like it should be chickens. Yeah, well done, kitchen. All right, so after you do these, after you do those, we come back and we just basically say, with a big long list of them, the people do bad. Say, ouch, oh, that was bad, that was bad, oh, sorry, that was bad. Now, the real question is, if I come back with an easy list again, to what extent are people willing to try? Because if you believe you're not good at something, you're gonna be less likely to try. And again, this study has been done so many times. Here's the, here's the finding that's kind of cool. Forget trial two. Trial two is just to be mean, to see how you did after you failed. This was to make you fail. We wanna know before you failed and after you failed. Turns out the group that was told, good for you, you did well, typically comes back and does about the same. Here's the fun part. The group that was told, good for you, you must have worked hard at this, comes back and does significantly better. And the group that was told, good for you, you must be smart, actually comes back and does significantly worse. We have this over and over and over again. This is called a mindset. So I wanted to spend just a minute on this one because this is probably the most important thing today. If you develop a mindset, basically what the mindset boils down to is you're either good at something or you're bad at something, and then if I'm bad at it, there's no reason to put any energy into it. It could be something like math. If a person says, I'm just not good at math, the issue with I'm not good at math is I've determined that I'm not good at math based on some criteria in the past, and as a result, in the future, I'm not gonna put any energy into it. Some people say I'm not good at speaking, I'm not good at drawing. How many of you would consider yourself pretty good at drawing? How many good drawers in here? How many consider yourself pretty bad at drawing? All right, this is kind of cool if you look around. Do you know what happens if you ask four-year-olds that question? They all think they're good at drawing. And if they're from a mean family, maybe three. If you got brothers, it's more like two. Um, but very young age, everyone else, I'm good at that. I can draw, I'm a very, I'll go draw you a picture right now. And they draw the picture and then the parents put them out in their refrigerator and they say things like, look at you, you're so good at drawing. Ask your parents when you were little if they thought you were good at drawing. First of all, they're gonna say, I'm not paying that kind of tuition. No, they don't. Basically, if you go back and ask, most parents will say, oh yeah, you were very good at drawing. You say, well, what did I draw? Well, I don't remember what you drew, but I'm coloring, you were good at coloring. You say, what kind of coloring? You know, then they're gonna say, I got something to do. But the issue here is parents will say to their kids, that's this group. Look at you, you're phenomenal, you're the best drawer around. And then the first time somebody comes along and says, that drawing stinks. That's a little, little like condition two. And at that point, we start to say, well, I guess I'm not a drawer. So the issue here, and Carol Dweck's done a ton of research on this, individuals who say, I'm terrible at speaking. Yeah, maybe, but most of it might be that you quit working at it and that somebody has told you you're bad at it. So we just have to be really careful with any of those things. I, I went to the grocery store one time and I bought a bottle of pop. I'm from Michigan, so it's pop, right? It's pop here. So I bought a bottle of pop and a candy bar. The, the woman at the cash register, she was about 18, 19 years old, so she goes to the cash register, two things. She goes beep, beep, and she looks at the thing, she says, it's $18.35. See, I had that same look. I said, 18.35, that can't be right. I looked at the two items, she looked at the cash register. I said, stop, it was an express lane, but there was nobody behind me, so even a teachable moment shouldn't slow down an express lane. I said, no, stop looking at the register. Look at those two items. It can't be $18. I'm serious, she looked right at me, and she said, yeah, I, I am not good at math. I said, well, you wouldn't have to be. Um, there are two items there. How much do you think the pop would cost? And she said, I don't know. I said, just guess, just pick a number. A dollar. And I said, okay, cool, how about the candy bar? I don't know, 75 cents. I said, okay, 
dollar and 75. If you add a dollar and 75, what would the answer be? She said, a dollar 75. I said, there, you do do math, and you're actually pretty good at it. And she said, oh, thank you for enlightening me on that whole concept. I guess I am good at math, or something like that. Um, she was actually kind of mean, but <laughs> I was trying to be helpful. So the concept was there was something about her that was so negative toward math that she couldn't even look at two items and do the addition for those two items. So we have to be very careful. What I would suggest is as you're doing stuff, just keep in mind what real evidence you have. And that's the whole thing I'm after here. What evidence do you have? And this is serious, actually. Think of the drawing, because the drawing is not very threatening at all. If you think about what evidence you have that you're actually not a good drawer. And the evidence you probably have is somebody, when you were very young, told you your drawing stunk, or you looked at it and thought, this isn't good enough to be considered with others. But if you didn't actually spend time working at drawing, you wouldn't be expected to be very good at it. There's some great workshops for faculty now. It's demonstrating to them how quickly you can learn something. And the, the guy I know, he's decided drawing is a really good way of doing this, because most, most adults consider themselves very bad at drawing. In fact, most adults are very bad at drawing. If I, I don't have time to do it right now, but if I said draw a person, many of you would draw a little stick figure, maybe put some hair on it and say, there, I'm terrible at drawing, this is what I got. You wouldn't actually even try to draw a person, because if you tried and failed, that's pretty threatening for yourself. So you just don't even try. The point is, you do a little stick figure or something. What he does, he has people draw a person, then he teaches them drawing techniques for about an hour and a half, and then he says, okay, now draw a person. And then he compares the pre and the post. And the faculty are absolutely amazed at 60 to 75 minutes of how much better they can get at drawing. But most people spend their entire life saying, I'm not good at that, I'm not good at that, and don't even try it. So what I guess I'm pointing out is if you're studying something, a required course like math, and the whole time you're saying to yourself, I'm no good at math, I'm no good at math, you don't actually process the possibilities of getting better at it. You spend all the time thinking, I can't do this. So just be careful with that. Um, speaking is the same thing. I had a student one time, this is actually kind of mean. Um, she came to me and she said, hey, Dr. Z, I know that there's a speech in this class, but I can't give a speech. I said, actually, there's not one, there's three speeches. She says, yeah, I can't do a speech. And I said, any kind? She said, no. I said, well, if you cannot do any kind of speech, then I'm going to waive the requirement because I can't make you do something you physically can't do. She said, thank you. I said, well, I can't just waive it that easily. I'm really busy right now. I have office hour on Thursday. If you can swing by on Thursday, I'm really, really busy. I can give you like two minutes. And if you can just explain to me why you can't give a speech, I'm going to waive the whole requirement. She seriously showed up. I know some of you are already smirking. You're way smarter than she was. She showed up on Thursday with note cards. She says, okay. I said, all right, you got two minutes. Go. Whew. All right. Well, I can't give speeches because I get really, really flustered. And when I get really flustered, I forget what I'm going to say. And I don't think that I should be put in front of others. And she went through her cards. And it took about a minute and a half. She did the whole thing. I said, that was brilliant. That was really well done. She said, thank you. Do I get out of the speech? I said, no, you just got an A on your first one, which is a persuasive speech. Now you just have two to go. And she said, oh my gosh, you're so good at teaching me these things, or something like that. Um, but the concept was, she, she did a beautiful speech to tell me why she couldn't do speeches. I've written three books, and I, was, I used to believe that I couldn't write because I had teachers in college that gave me C's on my first couple papers. First year of college, I got two C's on my first two papers. I figured, I thought I was good at writing. Two C's in a row, I thought, well, I'm not very good at writing. So from that point forward, all of my papers were C's and D's. But I'd get all A's on tests because I'm a good test taker. And you see what happened there is I actually had a fixed mindset. I believed I was terrible at writing. So you just got to be careful when those things happen. You got to put the energy in, that's it. Oh, it's, no, we're not singing birthday. It's tempting. All right. We don't care about that. We don't care about that. All right, a couple of last quick studies. I guess I got to get rolling here. There's some cell phone stuff that was really kind of cool. One of the studies that's out, which I really liked, having a cell phone out when it's turned off is more distracting than when it's not available at all. And what they found out, which was kind of cool, is just having it around. But that makes sense, right? If a phone is out and turned off, and you look at the phone, it's like, hey, I wonder what everybody's up to. I wonder what's going on. So anytime you're thinking about anything other than, now that I've reminded you of the cell phones, I know you're probably thinking, so many things probably have been happening in the last 45 minutes. So the best thing to do is when people say, get it out of sight, just get it totally away from you, it's a good way to go. 
Um, yeah, well, you missed that one. Learning styles, gotta hit this one really quickly. There's these four psychologists went out and looked at the, the concept called meshing, and it's teaching to a given learning style. So just imagine for a minute you're visual learners, you get to be auditory learners, and you get to be kinesthetic learners. The idea of me as a teacher is to have good visuals for my visual learners and good stories for my auditory learners and good writing opportunities and hands-on stuff for the kinesthetic learners. There are thousands and thousands of articles about how effective this is. The problem, absolutely no data. There is absolutely nothing out there that suggests, number one, that you're even a visual learner, and number two, that you do better when I provide visuals. The reason is this. If I show a really good image up here, everybody gets it. Everybody says, oh, that's helpful. If I have a really good anecdote and a story and you listen to it, you think, oh, okay, that ties in. The concept of I am a visual learner, well, first of all, how would you even know you're a visual? So I would, see, I didn't want to be mean enough to say how many of you are visual learners, how many, and you're all taught this. I mean, my daughter, the last year in her high school, six classes, she did four learning styles inventories because her teacher said, you need to do this. So if you're, let's just imagine you're a visual learner. If you're a visual learner, how would you know you're a visual learner? Let me know how you know it. How did you find out you're a visual learner? How would you find out such a thing? Did you guys ever take a test and find out what kind of learner you were? Where did you take it at? Did you go to a psychologist's office, somebody with a PhD and trained clinical background who gave you an extensive battery of diagnostic tests and helped you to identify through a whole series of tests of which way you process information? Some people do that, but not most people. Where did you take the test at? On the what? School? But where at school? Was it paper and pencil? Computer lab. Computer lab. Hey, good. Most of you take it on the computer lab, right? It's a computer test. Usually about 20 questions. And the one thing I want to just let you know right now as a psychologist, if, you really, if we really want to know what, how a person works and, and what, what's happening with an individual, a self-scored free test on the internet is not where we always go. And then the other part is the questions you were asked on the internet. If you're going to the airport and you don't know the way, would you prefer A, a friend writes out the directions for you, B, provides a diagram, or C, just explains to you how to get there? I pick D. I open up my Google Maps on my phone, drop it in the cup holder, and let it just tell me how to get there. But if you had to pick one of those first ones, let's imagine you say, I would like to look at a map. Next question, you're at a park, would you rather play on the merry-go-round, watch other people play, or hear stories while you're at the park? Ooh, I'd like to be on the merry-go-round. Ooh, that's a kinesthetic thing. So the point is, when you're done, it totals those up, and it says you've answered mostly visual types of things, is what your preference is. That's your preference, not your style of learning. So your learning preference is different from how you learn, but people keep throwing these terms together. So when you're done taking the inventory, you say, oh, I'm a visual learner. So is everybody who can see. Now, there are some visually impaired learners, and they have to learn other ways. But every, if you're walking along, and you see a great a manhole cover, you got a hole in the sidewalk, and you're walking along, you go, whoa, almost stepped in that, and then you walk around it. The next day, you walk up, and you just drop right into the hole. My first thought, oh, an auditory learner. Can't be a visual learner because you saw the hole. Can't be a kinesthetic learner because you walked around it. Must be an auditory learner that just couldn't learn that the manhole was actually open. So we don't do it that way. We learn by processing. Here's an example of it. This is from The Onion. The Onion is the America, you know, it's America's finest news source. This is parents of nasal learners demand an odorless odor-based curriculum. This is a little girl. This is a nasal learner struggling with an odorless. If you don't know about this, article, it's a joke. If you don't ever read The Onion, The Onion is phenomenal. It's just jokes about stuff. The school didn't really demand this, but the point here is we can't teach to certain people because they say, this is how I am. So we have to be careful you don't shut down at that process. So I already did the long-term potentiation. The last couple of slides, blue light, if you don't know about blue light, 
coolest stuff out right now, blue light will shut down melatonin production, which means if you're looking at a lot of blue light in the evenings, it actually hinders your sleeping. They have found in ICUs by changing the lights out from blue fluorescent lights to red and other warmer colored fluorescent lights, recovery time increased significantly because people got more sleep. People complained about not being able to sleep in hospitals for years. People said, I can never sleep in a hospital. They all use blue light because it looks more um, clean. If you're watching a computer screen, a television, if you take the blue blocker glasses and actually put those on in the evening, it actually helps you to sleep. And there are settings on your phone now that you could do F-Lux, F-L-U-X, and it will change your phone in the evening. The phone can tell when it's dark out, it will, or the timing, it just knows by the time of day. It'll change your blue light to other lights, and it actually helps people with their sleeping. The only other ones I mentioned is that there's all kinds of research that demonstrates sleep is hugely important for learning. Um, this is my favorite, was NASA astronauts. Basically, NASA astronauts, half were given a nap, half not given a nap. Hours after taking a nap, 34% increase in cognitive functioning. There's a concept in there that when people get fatigued, their brain just slows down their working. Exercise, long, this is not jumping jacks before you study. Exercise actually helps people to remember things. And the other one I have here is um, dehydration, which by the way, if you drink Mountain Dew, Pepsi, those are diuretics, they actually take water out of your system. If you, if you drink a Mountain Dew, your body is less hydrated than before you drank it. It's the craziest thing. It's the way that it actually takes water out of a system. So if you're working late at night, you're not drinking, or you drink Mountain Dew, you eat simple sugars, and you're exhausted, your brain actually starts to shut down. And when it does that, it makes it harder to learn new things. That's it. I did do a TED Talk, which was kind of fun to do. If you ever want to see that thing, you just have to look under, well, you're never going to remember how to spell my name, so never mind. So that was it. I think we hit it. We were supposed to be done at, let me just double check, 5.52, this is cool. So we hit it, I was supposed to be done at 10.2, so we're right there. If anybody have any quick questions, any questions about this stuff at all, I can answer your questions about this stuff. All right. Here's the biggest thing for you, seriously. Sleeping and exercise, that's probably the two biggest ones. Food's a big one too, but sleeping and exercise, those two things can have dramatically huge, huge, huge effects on your learning. So what you have to figure out is when you're exhausted and studying, when is it better to stop studying, go sleep for a little bit? And some of you will say, yeah, but if I sleep and I wake up, I'm all pissy. Um, that's a word of being like mad at people. Here's the thing, watch your sleep cycles. Sleep cycles are typically 90 minutes. If you sleep for about one hour, you actually put yourself in the delta state of sleeping for most people, which is your deepest sleep. And waking up from that makes you extremely groggy. So if you take a nap and you say, I, I hate napping because when I wake up, I'm really groggy, watch the timing. If it's approximately 50 minutes to an hour and 10 minutes, it's because you're in the deepest stage of sleep. Because what happens for the 90 minutes is you go down into the deep sleep and then you come back out. 20 minutes will actually drop you into stage one to stage two, and people typically can wake up very quick from that. That means a 20 minute nap, you wake up and you feel great for most people. For most people, you wake up at the one hour mark, you feel all angry and really sluggish and can't do anything. So it's when you sleep is a big thing, but there's huge benefits for doing that. All right, other than that, just, you know, hey, good luck. So I'm stopping there. Thank you all for coming, appreciate it. Thank you.